Well, good morning, everyone. It's a really good day to be in church today, isn't it? It's a pretty good day. Hey, if you're visiting with us this morning, we just want to say welcome. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, if you don't know who I am, really quick, my name is Danny Jones. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Sunshine Hills. And I know it can be odd to come to a church and hear someone you've never met before talk. So let me just talk with myself really quick. Then we're not strangers anymore. My name's Danny. I'm married to Erica, my beautiful wife in the front row here. We have three amazing daughters. We have two very furry, very troll-making cats at home. I really like comic books. I really like Disney. I really like food. And I really like travel. So now we're not strangers. Now you know who I am. Uh, so let's, let's do this, all right? Um, when I was in Bible college many years ago, uh, I had the great privilege of traveling all across Canada and all across the United States. Uh, every year, the college sends out tour teams of uh, for second year, third year, fourth year students who go to churches across North America, and they are promoting the Bible college, they're um, ministering in those churches, they're serving where need be, they're, they're visiting, they're leading services. Uh, in my second year, we had a, cross, a chance to go all the way across Canada, straight from the West Coast to the East Coast, down the East Coast of New York City, and back across the northern United States for over a month. It was incredible. The main draw that year is we had um, a group, some of my friends from college, they had formed an alt-rock band named Veneer. <laughs> terrible name. Um, and, and they were the big draw that every night we were going to have a, a concert uh, at all the churches we visited. And that was a big draw for youth and adults to come out. And then in my third year, I had a chance to go across the Northwest United States and uh, the Van Vancouver Island and, and the Okanagan. And that year, it was the second season that Survivor had aired. They're airing 40th season in about a month. That was the second season. It was like super popular. Everyone was talking about it. So as a group of students, we actually wrote a parody of Survivor. We wrote it ourselves. We performed it ourselves where we assumed various roles or caricatures of roles in the church and did a whole parody of how we'd vote each other out of the church. Uh, looking back, I'm not sure it was the most like sensitive drama that we ever could have done, but it went over really well at that time. Um, that was the big draw that we were going to do that. And fun fact, that was the trip where an Eric and I realized that we were meant to be. Now, she knew it right away, as the story goes. I required a little bit more time to figure that out. Um, anyways, there's many fond memories from those trips. The places that we stayed, the, the landmarks that we saw, the people that we met, the churches that we visited. But I remember, I look back now, and I go, as a young adult, second year, third year Bible college, I unfairly judged a lot of those churches, based on their building, based on what material assets they had, based on their cool factor, we joke about, like, this church is awesome, this church wasn't so great. I mean, there was one church in Oregon. It was an old movie theater. It was instantly cool. It was such a great... I remember Eric and I, we hung out, like, up in the projection booth. Like, when do you ever get to do that? It was the coolest church to be in. There was other church. It was, like, in an old school gym or a cafeteria. is very stark, very bare, and I was so frustrated because I was playing drums on the team that day, and usually when you have a drum kit, you put carpet underneath, because when you don't, and you're just on a bare floor in a cafeteria, you spend most of your set playing one-handed while you're holding the kick drum because it keeps sliding away from you as you're trying to play. That church was instantly not cool because of that. Um, there was a church in Boston that let the band Veneer record live late at night, and we found they had a double kick drum double kick pedal on their drum, which was very metal and very cool. So that church instantly was like, yes, this church has it. And then in Montana, we ended up in this small church in the middle of nowhere. And I will never forget this because we walked in and this older gentleman greeted us and he pulled back his leather vest to reveal a belt clip for all of his harmonicas, one for every key. And he's like, can I join you guys on stage for worship today? To this day, I'm not sure if that was cool or not cool. I, I guess it's, it's very memorable, though. So looking back, I, I, I guess see how narrow-minded I was, right? Like, to judge churches on a variety of aesthetics was re very narrow-minded, not fair. At the end of the day, the building, the decor, the gear, the material trappings, none of it really mattered because none of that defines what church is. We believe that the church is people. And what the people do in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, what, the, what people do in building healthy relationships and inclusive communities, that's what really matters. So this morning as you're here with us, we're currently in the middle of a series entitled Being Church. So for those of you who weren't here last week, a little bit of review so you're not coming on the second part going, I missed something. Three quick questions just to go over, just so you're all caught up. What is church? The church is people. Church is not a building, it's not an institution, it's, it's people. 
And because of this, there's no perfect church. And there's no perfect model for doing church because every church is made up of imperfect people. Sinners saved by grace who are doing our very best to follow Jesus and to bring others along in that journey. The church is relational. All that we do flows out of relationship with God and with each other. The church is a place for healing and for restoration. And the church has been entrusted with this gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ, which is life and hope for a dying and hopeless world. So what does being church mean? Simply put, being church means we don't just attend church. It's not something we just do. We are the church. Church isn't the activities that we do when we gather. We are the church. We, being church means that we are a reflection of Jesus in our world, that we are his ambassadors, that we carry who he is wherever we go. So we are the church. We be church wherever we walk. And there's this question that arises, church is a field or church is a force. It's two different models for doing church. It was popularized in the book Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness by a man named Jerry Cook. And as Pastor Tom shared last week, that book and, and that individual was very influential in Pastor Tom's life. And I would, I would admit in my life as well, I remember in like second year Bible college hearing about this book and then reading it and being shaped by it. And just really quick, when I first dated Erica, I remember going to lunch at your guys' house once. And Jerry was there for lunch, and I was like, as starstruck as you can be in Bible college. I'm like, we get to have lunch with Jerry Cook? Like, it blew my mind. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Anyways, he was an incredible person. His book shaped me. His time spent at our retreat shaped me. Uh, and what he says in that book is there's two models. There's the field model and the field model of doing church. The goal of the church is to create programs and events that attract people to come to the building to hear the message of Jesus, usually from a professional, one of the pastors, one of the people on staff. And he introduces this idea called the force model. The goal of the church in the force model is to equip the people to go and be Jesus, to be authentic witnesses of him, to go outside of the four walls of the church, to be the church during the week wherever they go. Now, last week, Pastor Tom unpacked the field model of the church for us. Our time here this morning, I want to talk a little bit about what it looks like to be the church as a force. First thing, let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. I thank you for the opportunity we have as the church to gather together to celebrate. God, thank you for, for Cam and for Nick who followed you in obedience and water baptism this morning. What an incredible testimony. What an incredible lives to celebrate. And God, I pray now as we turn to your word, as we open our hearts and our minds to hear what you would speak. God, would you just um, find fertile soil this morning? God, would you just speak to us? Would you instruct us? Would you encourage us? Would you inspire us? Praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to put two scriptures up on the, on the screen there. Two sections are going to inform where we're going today. The first is Matthew 28, verse 18, and 20, 18 to 20. We call this the Great Commission. Near the end of his time on earth, Jesus came and he said to his disciples, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. A few things of note from this particular passage is important for where we're going this morning. He said go. He didn't say wait. He didn't say bring them. He said go. He said do something, talk to people, do life with them, teach them, be the church, build the church. And then the thing that, that hits me every time, he says, and remember, I am with you always. In this thing I'm asking you to do, you are not alone. I'm going with you. And the second scripture is this, Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 11 and 12, it says, And he, Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, we call them pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, which is the church. And that scripture is so vital because what it's saying is that the role of those of us who have been called into ministry, the role of the professionals, quote-unquote, the pastors, the leaders, the apostles, the prophets, our role is to train. Our role is to equip and to release you the church, to go be Jesus, to go do ministry. That is our responsibility and our role. And in doing this, the church is built up. The church becomes stronger. It becomes more unified. It grows in its influence and becomes a force to be reckoned with. The church as a force is all about redeemed people, filled with the Spirit of God, meeting needs, and spreading hope in the name of Jesus. It's the model that sees the church as an active and powerful force in the community from Monday to Saturday, not just on Sunday morning. It's doing what God is asking of us outside of the four walls of our church. It's church in the wild. Now think about that for a second, church in the wild. It's pretty safe to do church in this building. 
it's pretty comfortable to do church in this building. But when we step out of those doors, we are met with a world that has questions. And questions are hard. We're met with a world that has conflicting worldviews, different beliefs, different value systems, behaviors that don't align with what we deem to be moral or right. It's church in the wild. We find brokenness. We find hopelessness. We find people that are struggling to do life. We find people who think they have it all together and don't need a thing that we have to offer them. It's church in the wild. What do we do with all this? Suddenly, it's a lot less safe and comfortable to be the church when we have to do it outside of the four walls of the church. But that's where we've been called. God, God has not asked us to huddle up inside of a building and separate ourselves from people or from the world until he returns. He's asked us to go and bring the good news of Jesus to a world that is in desperate need of his love and his hope that we know and we have experienced. He's asked us to be the church. Now think of it this way. For those of you who are sports fans, it's NFL playoff season. It's a big day today. It's conference championships. Think of it this way. Being the church at the church building, it's home field advantage. When you're here at the church and you're doing ministry, you're familiar with the playing field. You feel the support and the love of the crowd around you. And to some degree, we're expected to win on home field advantage. But there's something about the away game, isn't there? There's something about the away game. There's something about the thrill of going into another stadium and beating that team on their own turf. There's something about that. If you're sports fans, you know that. You know that thrill i going to change mics. Check, check, we're good? Okay. Nope, not any better? Ooh, I'm echoing. Let's bring that reverb down a little bit, okay? Suddenly it's the voice of God and not mine. It's very strange. And if you're a sports fan, you know when your home team goes into a stadium they're not expected to win in, and they win, there's an immense thrill in that moment, Right? There's something about claiming victory in a place you were expected to lose. And I would argue that for too long, our enemy, Satan, has staked a claim in our world and convinced the church that we cannot win outside of our church buildings. Church in the wild. Church as a force. It's about going into our opponent's arena and claiming victory. It's robbing the devil of whatever power he has on his own turf. How exciting is that? Right? That's a game I want to play in. So in a practical sense, what does this look like? Very easily, it just looks like being there for people. It looks like praying with coworkers at work. It looks like inviting someone over to your house who's hurting or in need of a safe place to just talk and be with someone. It's about being relational. It's about engaging in meaningful dialogue without declaring the other person wrong or forcing some sort of agenda on them. Just talking to them and dialoguing about what you believe. It's meeting needs as they arise. It's doing outreach that matters and makes a difference. It's simply doing good and affecting positive change, no matter how small or large, in the name of Jesus. One of the things that I am so incredibly proud of our church for in this last year was when we stepped up to partner with the City Dream Center here in Surrey. If you're not familiar with that, there's an organization known as City Dream Center who works out of Surrey to, um, to help those who are less fortunate, to help kids and families in need. And just really quick... This is their year-end report. They have an adopt-a-school program where churches can adopt schools that have low-income families. In, in 2019, adopt-a-school grew from 14 to 23 schools adopted, one of which was J.T. Brown Elementary, which our church adopted. That's 8,800 kids in Surrey whose lives are affected by this program. 8,800 kids who live below the poverty line, whose families are struggling, that churches have adopted to help. Their back-to-school program, which is at the end of August to get kids and families set up for September, expanded from one location to three locations in 2019, and 4,500 people from local churches showed up to help that day. It's incredible. And then the Christmas projects that we were a part of just a month ago, the, uh, the Christmas gift box project and the Christmas hamper project, uh, 3,123 gift boxes went out to kids in seven adopted schools. That was full of Christmas presents and Christmas chocolates and candy canes, things to open on Christmas morning for families that may didn't have anything to open. And then 250 food hampers were delivered to families in need. And once again, our church, we were a part of that. We sent teams to that. That's what doing church in the wild looks like. That's what a church as a force looks like. The work that we do in partnership with the City Dream Center, it's meeting real, actual needs in our city. It's an outreach that is actively making a difference, and none of it is happening inside of our four walls. The church as a force is its very best work out there. 
wherever the people are. In the midst of the chaos of life and the confusion of our culture, believers are equipped and mobilized to be a force for good, to establish the kingdom of God out in the wild. That's exciting. It's the kind of church that I want to be a part of. Now, one of the defining characteristics of the Church of the Force is, is this idea, uh, every member a minister. Now, I know that sounds very churchy and very old school, but it's how I learned it, and old habit, habits die hard. But what we mean when we say every member a minister is simply this. It's the idea uh, that every individual who comes into the church is equipped and released to go and do ministry, to share their faith, to care for others, to provide godly counsel, to meet needs, that we equip and we release people to go and do that. It means allowing people to do the things that God is asking them to do and taking time to make sure that they are actually prepared to do those things. Equipped and released, both parts are vital because sometimes we have some bad habits in church. One of them is this. We equip people, we get them trained, we get them ready to go, and then we fail to release them. We communicate that it's not, it's not quite your time. A little bit more work needs to be done here. We need to grow some more. You know, maybe it's better if the main leader takes this one. And we equip them. We fill them up with knowledge and understanding, but we never release them. On the other hand, I've also seen it, we get so fired up and excited, we just release everybody with no training and no equipping. Just go do something in the name of Jesus. Now, God is faithful, and he will cover that in grace. But it's not wise or prudent for us to just send everybody out without any measure of training or equipping or praying for people or getting people ready for what God's asked them to do. We have a responsibility to be prepared. As a church, we must be willing to both equip and to release. So a couple quick thoughts on these two things. Equipping comes down to two, two components, to be equipped in the spirit and to be equipped in the word. Equipped in the spirit means equipped in the gifts that God has given you and in the power that the Holy Spirit gives you. And equipped in the word because that's our foundation. We believe that the Holy Spirit equips God's people with spiritual gifts for the work of ministry. The gifts of the spirit are basically God's means of getting to people and meeting their needs through willing believers which means that we need to help people understand what their spiritual gifts are, how to use them, how to walk in them, how to walk in step with the Holy Spirit of God. That's what equipping looks like. And the second component is to know and to understand the Word of God. It is our foundation. It is truth. It is the manual for how to do life. In order to effectively go and be the church, to be Jesus in our world, we have to be people that are rooted in His Word and know what He's talking about, which means that when we gather We have to encourage people to be in the Word. We have to encourage one another to be students of the Word, to share with each other what God's speaking to us through His Word, to soak up all the teaching that we can receive about His Word. This is what equipping looks like. And then one quick note on releasing. So often the fear in releasing people to do ministry is rooted in all these what-ifs. What if they fail? What if they don't do it the way that I would? What if they do it better than I would? Right? There's all these fears attached to the idea of releasing. Here's the main thing to always keep in mind. The power is in the gospel, not in the presentation or the delivery. The power is in the gospel, not in the presentation or the delivery. If you look at the Bible, both Moses and Paul, two of the most influential church leaders in church history, by their own admission, were terrible speakers and terrible leaders. They said, God, not, like, not me. Like, I am not the right person for this job. But their track record speaks for itself. Be released to share, and the Bible says when the time comes, the Holy Spirit will give you the words. It's an incredible promise. There's one other question that comes to mind when we talk about this idea of every member a minister, and it's this. What do we do when we gather as the church? If every member is a minister, is it just a free-for-all on Sunday morning? Do we just like, all right, let's, let's have at it. We're all ministers. So let's see what happens this morning. Not at all. When the church operates as a force, our time gathered on Sunday mornings takes on new meaning and new purpose. When we gather, it's a time to celebrate. It's a time to celebrate wins. It's a time to celebrate lives changed. It's a time to support and encourage one another. It's time to get trained and get equipped. It's a time to be in God's presence and to hear his voice. And the church is a force when it gathers. It's characterized by worship and community. A true sense of love for God and for each other. And here's the thing. It may not be the traditional church of the field model But when the church operates as a force and when it gathers, you can still invite people to come, just in case you want to know that. When the church as a force gathers, there's nothing like it. It's the most vibrant, most dynamic thing you can see. It's full of vision and purpose. It's a tangible sense of God's presence and his spirit at work. And I believe, and I'll stand on this, the authentic 
presence of God revealed through a people that passionately love him attracts people. It doesn't dispel people. But when we try to put on a show, when we try to conjure up God, when we get goofy as Christians are op- often apt to do, or when we try to be super religious, that's really a turnoff. And we can't afford that because there's too much at stake. Above all, the church is meant to be inclusive. The Bible says that he, Jesus, died once for all, that every single person could come to know his love and his forgiveness. The same idea applies to this. Every member of minister, it's inclusive. We all have a role to play, and we are all on his team. And honestly, this is the great mystery to me. Almighty God, omnipotent, omniscient, eternal, he can literally do anything because he's God. And he can accomplish his purposes however he so desires. And yet, his chosen means of communicating his message of love and hope to the world is to draft us onto his team. It's a great mystery to me. He looks at humanity. He looks at broken, fallible, imperfect humanity. He says, that's the team I want. Those are the people that I am choosing to get my message out there. You and me, he's chosen us. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in his second letter to the church in Corinth. He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay. And I love that image. It's the idea that God has placed this incredibly valuable message of salvation and hope into frail earthen vessels, jars of clay, you and me. During the final hours that Jesus shared with his disciples, he said this in John 15. He said, I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy and your joy wholly mature. This is my command. Love one another the way that I have loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. You are my friends when you do the things I command you. I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I have called you friends because I have let you in on everything that I've heard from the Father. And I love that image. Jesus looks at his disciples, the people that he's walked through life with. He says, you are my friends. You're not my followers. You're not my servants. You're my friends. And everything the Father has told me, everything he's told me about his mission and the church and what we're going to be doing here on earth, I've let you in on all of it because I'm entrusting you, my friends, to carry on what I've been doing in my absence. I'm putting you in the game. You're on my team now. Go and be the church. And remember this. The church, church is not a spectator sport. It's just not a spectator sport. You can't be the church and sit on the sidelines. Now, there's plenty of reasons why individuals choose to sit out, to not be active participants. I'd like to dispel at least one of them right now. It's not any safer on the sidelines. Can I say that? Um, When I was a kid, my my dad was a basketball coach. And as a young kid, I went to a ton of games with him and practices. And at one time in this tiny gym, I got to sit on the team bench and watch the game. And for a moment, I stopped paying attention. And I took a basketball to the face so hard on the bench. You look at my nose, it is not straight. It is forever crooked. I took a lot of things to the face of playing sports, but I remember that day very specifically. I, I glanced away for a second and get somebody's super lightning pass, gets bam, square on my face. It hurt. It is not safe on the sidelines, people. It's just not. The reality of being drafted to his team is the fact that we as the church, as believers, we're in a spiritual battle. We have a very real enemy, and Satan will try to take you out, whether you are in the game or whether you are sitting on the bench. And if you're sitting on the bench, if you're removing yourself from being a part of ministry and, and being the church, he'll try to deceive you. He'll say things like, yeah, you're not good enough. You know, you got nothing to offer. Those other people do church way better than you can do it. Just, just sit out for a while. I don't, like, God doesn't need you. Just, just take a breather. Every single one of those things are lies. Every single one of those. God chose you. He in, has entrusted you with the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. He believes in you, and he has asked you to be part of creating this thing called church here on earth. And can I make one thing painfully clear this morning? I've been talking about battles and enemies and playing fields and opponents. The opposition that I speak of isn't people. The opposition that I speak of isn't people. We're not fighting against people that don't know Jesus. We're fighting for people that don't know Jesus. Our opposition is the spiritual forces that we believe are at work in the world. Ephesians 6, verse 12, Paul says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. People are not the enemy, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That is our opposition. 
Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We're not fighting against people. We're fighting against spiritual forces. The church is, meant, church is meant to be a force for good in this world, so we need to keep in mind who we're fighting for, the name of Jesus, the lost, the broken, the disenfranchised, the forgotten, the people that we love and care for and want to invite on this journey called life, who we're fighting against, our enemy, Satan, the thief who comes only to steal and kill and destroy. We are not fighting people. We are fighting a real enemy and spiritual opposition. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up and join me on stage as we come to a close here this morning. Where does this leave us? It said a lot of things this morning. Church is a force. Church is a field. In here, out there, come and see, equip and go. Over the years, and I've talked to Pastor Tom about this as well, we've come to hold the belief it's not one or the other. It's not one or the other. It has to be a combination of both. You know, the traditional model of church where we gather on a Sunday morning and we invite people to come hear the, the good word from a pastor or a preacher, it worked really well for a long time. And then the pendulum swung and culture changed. And wise godly leaders have realized that the church need to get outside of the four walls and be the church in the world. We need to be a force for good. And, and that model had great success. And I, I look around our city now and I see great churches that are all about getting people into their building to hear a preacher speak about Jesus and hear the word of God. And they are experiencing tremendous success and great growth. And I applaud them for that. And I pray that God is with them in that. And I see other major, amazing churches that are all about equipping people and sending people and doing outreach and being the church in the world. And they are finding great success and their churches are growing. There is no perfect model for doing church because God has called imperfect people to reach other imperfect people. And there's a, a multitude of ways to do that. So why would we not use every single tool and every single method that God has given us to get his message of love and acceptance and forgiveness out into a world needs to hear it. After all, it's too important of a message to ever limit how it gets out. So this morning as we close, be encouraged. Be encouraged that God has called you to be part of his team, that he has put you in the game, that he believes in you. Be inspired by the fact that you have a role to play. Every member a minister, it's time to get equipped so you can go and be released. And be challenged to stop playing it safe within the four walls of this building. Let's have some fun. Let's be a force for good. Let's do church in the wild. Let's go and let's be the church. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for this time of celebration as we gather, as we praise, as we worship, as we celebrate lives that are changed and have chosen to follow you in baptism. God, thank you for this word of encouragement and challenge of what it means to be the church. God, I pray for every single person here, God, that you would speak to them this morning you would encourage them. With every eye closed and every head bowed, we do this every week because there is one question that is the most important question to ask, and it's the, it's the Jesus question. Jesus says, I have died for you. I love you. I'm ready to forgive you. Will you accept what I have done for you? Will you choose to follow me? And if you're here this morning and you've never made a personal decision for Jesus, to have him come be part of your life, to accept his love, his, his forgiveness, to to walk in what he's asking you. It's as simple as raising your hand this morning. No one's looking around. No one's judging or making assumptions. Simple as raising your hand is acknowledgement, saying, God, I need you. I need your love. I need your acceptance. I need your forgiveness. I need the hope that you're offering. If that's you this morning, would you raise your hand? I'd love to pray with you. Is there anyone this morning who would say, God, I need you? I see that hand. So for those who have raised their hands this morning, as simple as this praying, God, I believe in you. I believe that you died for me and that you rose again. I believe that you love me and forgive me of my sins, and I choose now to have you come into my life and to follow what you're asking of me. And if you raised your hand and made that choice this morning, you are welcome to come talk to me after service, talk to Pastor Tom, talk to any number of people, whoever brought you this morning. They would love to tell you all about this life that we walk with Jesus and what it means. God, for us as the church, would you help us know how best to be the church? Would you challenge us to be the church outside of these four walls? Would you put opportunities in our place to speak to people, to pray with people, to meet needs? And God, not every encounter needs to be overly spiritual. Not every encounter needs to have a, a call for salvation. It can be as simple as giving food to someone who's hungry. 
praying with someone who gets heard the worst news of their life. God, would you just open our eyes and help us to be sensitive to the needs of those around us? And then when the time comes, would you give us the courage and the strength to step out and to be the church, to be you in our world? I ask this and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to thank you guys so much for coming here this morning. It's been a great morning. Um, like I said, there's some things coming up. If you're interested in our Life Shared series that's starting this Wednesday, just sign up on, on the info desk out front. You're welcome to hang around for a while and, and, and chat, mingle. We have a coffee shop downstairs. We'd like to get some coffee. Uh, be blessed. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for coming.